In 1997, Squaresoft released Final Fantasy VII, a game that set the world on fire and permanently changed the entire culture of gaming. For some people, it's one of the most important pieces of media in their lives, and one scene in particular stood out amongst the rest. So, why do you need to know Final Fantasy VII? Between the years of 1994 and 1997, the Sony PlayStation, Sega Saturn, and Nintendo 64 were launching, and the latest console war was beginning. The PlayStation spawned from a failed dealing with Nintendo in which Nintendo turned their backs on Sony after a contract dispute in order to negotiate a CD-based system with Philips. While the Sony PlayStation and Sega Saturn both utilized CD-ROMs, believing this to be the future, Nintendo decided to stick with cartridges. This decision was due to how much faster the processing was compared to CDs. However, there was a trade-off. The storage size of these cartridges was far smaller than that of the CD-ROM-based alternatives. Amidst these new consoles releasing, Squaresoft had just released the critically acclaimed Final Fantasy VI to both US and Japanese markets, and planning had already begun on Final Fantasy VII. The game was intended to be a 2D game for the Super Nintendo. However, amidst delays due to the team's involvement on titles such as Chrono Trigger, Final Fantasy VII was eventually set to be released on the next generation of consoles with the Nintendo 64. And this was when problems arose. Despite a strong relationship with Nintendo, their decision to use cartridges for the system instead of CD-ROMs led to a dispute with Square, who wanted to create larger worlds and games. All of this led to Square announcing in 1996 that they would be releasing Final Fantasy VII exclusively to the Sony PlayStation, a console still in need of games with name recognition. Resuming development in 1995, Squaresoft spent around $45 million developing Final Fantasy VII, the largest budget that had ever been spent on a video game. They followed this up with a three-month advertising campaign, the largest video game advertising campaign at that time, advertising across mediums into varied demographics. Now, the most anticipated epic adventure of the year will never come to a theater near you. Final Fantasy VII. Between the growing popularity of the Final Fantasy franchise and the immense advertising campaign, FF7 hit like a bombshell. The previous Final Fantasy had taken a full year to reach 2.55 million copies sold in Japan. Final Fantasy VII sold just under 2.5 million copies in three days. Meanwhile, in the United States, Final Fantasy VII reached 1 million sales within five months, a milestone FF6 never reached in its entire SNES lifetime. This was the best a JRPG had ever sold outside of Japan, and it's credited with popularizing the JRPG genre in the United States, which brought about a JRPG boom on both the PlayStation and outside of Japan. Even more importantly, at the time, many claimed it to be THE game that sold the PlayStation. Take into consideration, prior to the 1997 release of Final Fantasy VII, the PlayStation has sold a total of around 13.5 million units. In 1997, the year Final Fantasy VII was released, the console sold 19.37 million units, and then an additional 21.6 million in 1998. Final Fantasy VII was also the second best all-time selling game on the PlayStation, second only to Gran Turismo. This so drastically boosted the PlayStation's popularity that it effectively helped win the console war for PlayStation. This led to EarthBound 64 developer Benny Maru Ito to speculate that the Nintendo 64's low popularity in Japan was due to a lack of RPGs. Besides selling really well, the game was also critically well received. Frankly put, it's an overall damn good game. Final Fantasy VII starts in Midgar, the major world metropolis run exclusively by the Shinra Electric Power Company, who drill into the planet to drain its life energy in order to use it as a power source. You control Cloud, Tifa, and Barrett, members of the Shinra rebel group Avalanche. The game begins with a literal bang as Cloud and crew raid and destroy a Shinra-operated reactor. Escaping from this eventually leads Cloud to another major protagonist, Aerith, in the Midgar slums. Your team eventually works its way out of Midgar, and for the first time you realize you're in the massive world of Final Fantasy VII. Like previous Final Fantasy games, you travel across the world from town to town as you find yourself in the middle of a quest to save the world. You'll battle hundreds of enemies along the way, as various cutscenes further immerse you in a well-told and paced story that simultaneously develops the world and characters you inhabit, and the social, psychological, and emotional ideas and reactions created by their actions. 
One scene in particular impacted players across the board. While incredibly well known at this point, it is a massive spoiler to the beginning of the game, so you can click on the skip button if you'd like to avoid the spoiler. As you're nearing the end of the first disc, Aerith has abandoned the group in order to save the world on her own, in a way that only she can make happen. Cloud and company eventually arrive to a beautiful forest cathedral in the catacombs, where they find Aerith bending over, summoning the Earth-saving force. Cloud is suddenly overcome by the phantom power of the game's primary antagonist, fan-favorite Sephiroth, who manipulates Cloud into raising his sword to kill Aerith. Cloud overcomes Sephiroth's grasp, only to watch Sephiroth fall from the sky and do the job himself. Aerith's death marked a new dramatic point in video game storytelling. While Squaresoft and other RPG-making companies had killed off characters in prior games, never before had they done so to a primary party member who players had developed such a large emotional attachment with over gameplay. It was the first time a character's death resonated so hard amongst gamers. Along with this scene, many other elements of Final Fantasy VII dug its way into gaming culture. Cloud's image, with his spiky hair and ridiculously large sword, became a gaming trope for talking about JRPG characters. Chocobos, the popular and cute mounts of the series which had been around since Final Fantasy II, cemented their status as the mascot of the Final Fantasy franchise through the popular breeding and racing system minigame, which also doubled as a path to the overwhelmingly strongest skill in the game. The soundtrack was ingenious, crafted by the series' original composer Nobuo Uematsu, who had already been growing in fame. The Final Fantasy VII soundtrack pushed him ever deeper into his status as one of video games' most recognizable composers. The song One Winged Angel, in particular, became one of video games' most recognizable tracks that continues to be remixed to this day. Due to his somewhat criticized translation, Aerith's name was changed to Eris in English versions of Final Fantasy VII. This became a huge point of contention amongst fans of the game, with the vocal majority of the fanbase considering you a true fan only if you called your character Aerith. Meanwhile, the Japanese katakana of Aerith is Erisu, so it was actually an understandable translation choice. Final Fantasy VII is considered to be a major reason for the PlayStation 1's success in the console wars. The game's success brought about the boom of JRPGs exporting outside of Japan, and its narrative brought a new level of maturity to the gaming industry, which future RPGs would build upon. The game also proved the importance of marketing in the video game world. While it wasn't the first of its kind to have a mature and impactful story, it was by far the most successful, bringing a new level of respect to the medium of video games and drawing in people who had never before played games. Games. It's thanks to all of this that even today, the announcement of a Final Fantasy VII remake can cause reactions like this. Hey guys, if you like my new series, You Need to Know, let me know as I'd love to continue making more. Meanwhile, if you did enjoy this, you may enjoy my comedy retrospective series The Super Shows or my Chronicles of Gaming show. Also, a huge shout out to my friend Matt, who's helping me produce this series. And I'll see you guys next time. Peace.